Today's talk is going to be um, a talk that I haven't done before, uh, with parts of the talk that I actually promised to do for the conference. If I can get there, we'll see how far we get in the slides. Um, let me just find that PDF. Um, where is it? Oh, there it is. Generated 15 minutes ago. All right. So, um, Shijan reached out to me uh, because of I, or, and referenced a talk that I gave at an, a conference called IO, which is a conference that's primarily for data visualization and media art. Um, largely people who are working in the design fields um, along with artists, um, the, working with code and data as creative materials. So I'm going to do um, a talk that's related to that. Um, but I went down a social justice rabbit hole last night. Um, so there's going to be a lot of stuff that I've been thinking about for a long time, but haven't necessarily articulated in a complete talk. But it has plenty of examples. Um, so we also agreed that I would do um, this bit that I call shock and awe, uh, which I'll explain in a moment, and uh, which is essentially all of my work for about 18 years in four minutes. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> no, I'm not kidding. <laughs> so. Um, the title from the, for this talk, uh, in case you weren't aware, aware of it, comes from a piece by Jenny Holzer called Truisms, which was this series of texts or kind of um, things that sound like commercial slogans almost, but they're, they're sort of quite hard hitting and quite deep. You know, the idea of abuse of power comes as no surprise. So, you know, uh, paraphrasing that, I call this talk, abuse of an algorithm comes as no surprise. And I think most of you can probably agree with me. That's, you know, it isn't surprising. Um, so this is from the same series. I just like this one a lot because cruelty is always possible later. Uh, and finally, if you aren't political, in your, uh, then your personal life should be exemplary. Um, you know, in these election times, I don't know if being political is, is quite the sort of cop out. So my name is Marius. I'm from Norway. Uh, I never went to art school, but I'm an artist. I never completed a degree, but I teach people at the master's and PhD level sometimes. Um, and I started coding on a TRS-80 color computer um, back in the 80s. But then I got to computer science, which I always thought, like, this is what I'm going to do. And I realized computer science, at least the way it was taught in the early to mid-90s, is the most boring thing that I could imagine doing with a computer. Um, traveling salesman, you know, has its place, but it really didn't connect with me. Um, I hope you don't find that statement offensive. It's obviously not that, uh, that I think computer science has you know, uh, no potential. It's just more the things that I was really interested in doing with it um, just wasn't being taught. So I dropped out of computer science and started working with graphic designers, um, trying to apply ideas from code um, to design problems and to artistic problems which meant that in 94, there was no way you could go for that. So I started designing rave posters, um, doing these like crazy 3D rendered things um, <clears throat> that were all generated with code. Um, so that means that you know, 20 years later, I find myself as an autodidact um, coming from a quite sort of mutant hybrid practice. So today, I do all kinds of things. Uh, I'm an artist. I'm a creative technologist. You can hire me. Um, I call myself an aestheticist for hire. Um, and also, I teach workshops and also occasionally at uh, proper educational in, um, institutions. That's me with um, my original color basic instruction book. And if you look in the corner, you can see that's actually the TRS-80 like, stuck all the way back there. I don't think it works anymore. <laughs> And my work looks like this. This is basically what you get if you Google image search me. Um, and to give you the complete overview, I will open processing um, and do the, show all of it. Let's see. Oh, that's th I need three. Does anyone know, does everyone know processing? Yeah? Uh, so processing is the kind of tool which might be a little superfluous to uh, requirements for proper coders, in quotation marks. Uh, but it takes away all the tedium of creating projects and setting up Java, et cetera. It's essentially a Java um, framework for creative coding. And it worked quite well. So this piece is, let me just check my display settings, because um, this piece was created a few years ago. So I didn't, this is for like 10, 24, 768. So I got to optimize a little bit. Um, 
Essentially, I just collected all the Im images that I could find of my work and made a, a, a playback system that plays it back in, let's see what's going on here. Uh, oh, that's the wrong, this is the wrong version. Um, I fixed that yesterday. But now it's going to be full screen. Where is it? Um, for the reason. That should be the one. <laughs> uh, so I'll just go comment out this. Yeah, this would be much cooler at a conference where you don't know code. <laughs> 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 they would be impressed. <laughs> Here it's not so much. Let's see if we can run this. So if we can get the lights and uh, turn up the volume.
so that's, uh, that was 919 slide, if you watched uh, the meter there, uh, and it accelerates, of course. So, uh, and in case you didn't figure it out, the stuff at the end is actually the oldest, so all that is from like 94. So I have to get, give credit to Golan Levin, uh, who's a fantastic interactive artist and uh, developer, one of the people who's um, supported open frameworks in, into existence. He's also been involved in processing, but he suggested to me, because he knew that I had thousands of images just lying around, um, why don't I do an interactive presentation where I just sort of skip through all my slides and then have like people be like, wait, 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 can you talk about that? Uh, but he trusts audiences way more than I do, so I did a, the non-interactive version. Um, and now for something slightly less pleasant, but um, probably way more important. Um, so when I talk about like political issues um, to people who are not necessarily like interested in, it's not that people, the audience isn't interested, it's more just like, but this is not what I do, why do I have to listen to this? Uh, I feel compelled to include a lot of disclaimers. So some of the ideas that I'm gonna talk about might seem controversial, um, I don't think they are, but you know. It happens. Um, the basic argument is simple, which, which is that technology is not a neutral thing. Technology, whether it's based on you know, completely pure mathematics, is never a neutral, a priori, um, innocent object. Because technology is always applied by the users and the people who create tools. Hence, whether you, you, you created an infrared sensor or a machine learning algorithm, there are implications of these tools that you cannot disavow. You got that? <laughs> Is that a fair statement so far? Um, it, because I think as coders, um, it's very easy to become seduced by this idea of a per perfect world of algorithms, which is kind of like the way that economists became, become seduced by the perfect world of the market. You know, the invisible hand, banks will regulate themselves, it's gonna be great. Um, which turns out to not be true. And when you combine banks and algorithms, you get some really profound fuckery going on. Um, <laughs> because coders are people, right? I mean, who, who in here can say that, like, I've never written a flawed and stupid project in my life, right? Like, it's just a thing. Uh, when you think about sort of real-time mission-critical stuff, like, you know, things that have to control space stations, that, that stuff becomes terrifying. <laughs> And in fact, you know, how many space missiles have they lost because of, you know, flotation mark errors? Like, it happens. Um, so the goal in, in pu putting out the following um, sort of concerns more than conclusions is that I'm interested in, uh, not in political correctness, because that's kind of bullshit, because it's just a pseudonym for decency, um, but I want technology to consider decency and um, the existence of different human experiences. So when you're talking about IBM's Watson, which you know, has, he's leveled up from, um, from playing Jeopardy to um, looking at your medical charts uh, to figure it out if you have cancer or not, and who knows, maybe Watson is excellent at that. Um, but all these trends that we're seeing right now are deeply linked to understanding and facilitating human experiences. That means that you're moving into a whole other area than optimizing traveling salesmen, you know? Um, so, but, but the corollary is also that even the most unassuming software developer has the power, particularly in this day and age, to affect society. You know, if Uber is able to disrupt um, labor politics primarily through an API and a set of protocols, and Airbnb is able to pretty much undermine urban planning, why shouldn't your apps and APIs be able to affect change in a positive direction? And that's not some didactic hypothetical statement. That's a fact. So, um, but before I begin again, I'm, you know, I'm a white guy. I'm a Caucasian male born in Norway, hugely privileged in terms of um, the sort of safety, security, um, network that I was provided with just by default. In Norway, we don't really believe in people living under bridges. You're not gonna drop out of society because you've got a health problem. And I'm not saying that that's, you know, I'm not saying, not trying to say anything about America like based on that, but <laughs> let me just say <laughs> that I'm aware of the privilege that that comes with. Also, most of the issues that I'm talking about here, um, 
you know, deal with a lived reality that I don't share. Um, so I don't presume to talk for anyone else, um, but I can talk about it from the perspective of being a developer who hopes fervently that the tools I might create won't impact other people negatively. So <clears throat> this is an email from Dave Schroeder of the IO Festival. Um, and it's not a very sort of exciting email, it, but the first paragraph is all about appropriate content. And in, that email, and in that email, he stipulates, you can swear on stage, but you cannot denigrate the, ex, uh, the experience of someone who is other than you. you know, or even, you know, the, it could be another white male. You just, you know, be a decent human being and consider the political implications of being on stage, which, you know, should be kind of obvious, um, but I don't get these emails like a lot. I know that um, papers we love, I think, have a code of contact, right? Which is something that comes out of from other conferences not having them and failing miserably at addressing you know, harassment and abuse happening at conferences, because it happens. So if we're all awesome, why does the word programmer even exist? <laughs> when I heard that expression, I was just so mad. It's like, what is this? Like, do you want to identify with that word? What does that word tell you? It's a word that, that segregates people in different groups and reinforces the power of one. Um, you know, if, you, if, if we're all you know, potentially geniuses, why haven't we been be able to get rid of programmer? I mean, it's such a stupid word, too. Um, so, you know, the fact that people are smart does not mean that they're automatically good. Um, you know, that's, that's been pretty well proven. Through, um, through history. And I'm not saying that the present audience is racist or sexist. I've, in fact, I've, I have a pretty good idea that um, you're very likely to be. But stupid shit does go on. And sometimes good friends of yours surprise you negatively. So uh, geek, the Geek Feminism Wiki uh, has recorded a lot of these. Uh, one of the sort of famous ones that I think actually like, led to this being created was the, the fork joke at the Python conf. Like, I don't remember when. But if you, if you look at this, it has a timeline, and it starts in 1973. Um, does everybody know the Lena image? The test image for image processing, the sort of canonical image, the same way that the Utah teapot is the test measurement for, for 3D meshes, it's a Playboy centerfold. You know, um, that's, you know, fairly implicitly sexist right there. Uh, I mean, the image is not that, you know, offensive itself, but it says something to the cultural context that it comes from. Um, it also goes on and updates it, and it's quite depressing to read, um, but the fact that this exists means that we can do better. Um, so Moritz Stefaner, who's a data visualizer uh, from Germany, he created, um, because he's, you know, a speaker at conferences regularly, so he created a visualization to basically look at himself or the group that he belongs to, which happens to be the, the group that I also belong to, and figured out what is, the, you know, what is the actual gender balance at these various conferences. And this is where transparency that's required to actually look at things like diversity actually is based on databases. You know, if we have a data set that represents um, participants and winners of awards, um, then we might actually be able to look at what are the facts in our own community. And if we can't do better, then how can we expect anyone else to? Um, this is a quite funny article that came out, which is just you know, purely using the you know, mathematical facts. It proves that the idea that you would have an all-male panel at a mathematics conference is just you know, astronomically improbable. And this is one area where I, f I think that like, um, these tools, which technically, you know, like historically have served the, the, the sort of the status quo and the technocrats, what if, you put, you, what if you turn that data back on them? It's like, well, that's actually really unlikely <laughs> that you would have an all-male panel. Um, I've sat on all-male panels, and I've, I've vowed to not do it again because it's pretty uncomfortable. Um, it's another good uh, piece by Anand Prasad, which um, deals with statistics. I'm not actually completely um, sure about the details. But it, it stipulates that if, for instance, in a calculation where uh, a random selection of 20 people, of which um, t women constitute 10% of the available speakers, these are the sort of likely distributions that you would get. And in fact, it would be more likely from a statistical viewpoint to have women overrepresented compared to their actual percentage in the group than to have them you know, just like missing. 
Um, so anytime you go to an architecture conference um, and you wonder why there are no women on, on stage, you know it's because there's something that prevents them from being there. So that's cultural bias. You know, that's, that's one of those like, big bugbears that we can't all agree on. And you know, we all agree that it's like, it sounds like a good idea, but I don't even know like, how do I invite more women or people of color, et cetera. Like, if I organize a conference, what if I don't know them? Which, it, it's a very complex issue. But there is a simpler issue, uh, well, simpler in the sense of being sort of scientifically provable, which is what, what happens when technology becomes the bias when the bias is actually coded into the technology. Which I think, you know, that's one of those, similarly to that statistics exercise, it becomes hard to argue that, you know, a face, like a facial recognition um, software that can't identify um, non-Caucasians, it's not hard to say that that's bias encoded in an algorithm. So can an algorithm be racist? Yeah, take a wild guess. <laughs> Why should it be any different? However, you can say that like, oh, but software developers can't be expected to deal with these issues because they're so deeply ingrained in like social um, and historical uh, factors. But we adhere to principles of accessibility on a routine basis. Why wouldn't bias and cultural insensitivity be something that software developers could be trained to avoid? Um, the first time that I really came across a story that sort of involved this um, was 2009. Um, HP released some laptops with webcams that had face tracking, you know, an algorithm that we now take for granted. Every camera has it. Uh, but uh, um, two coworkers tried it out, and the, the black coworker realized that the image tracking, like face tracking, stopped, stopped working instantly as soon as the white woman moved out of the picture. And HP at the time came out with the sort of, you know, by now traditional statement like, we don't know what's going on, it's an algorithm, we don't really know. Um, <clears throat> And at the time, I remember like, seeing it and thinking, like, well, I can see how that would happen. Um, I don't see how like, HP could like, support con it continuing to happen, but it's sort of you know, early days of technology or whatever. It, you know, in terms of like, the offensiveness rank, it's like, yeah, that's really not great. But no one's going to die from you know, not being tracked on this webcam on a laptop. Um, but then I read this article, which is an amazing article that I recommend everyone to read. Um, I will publish this PDF with these uh, links as, as hyper, hyperlinks. Uh, and this is a link, uh, this is a story by Sarita McFadden about white balance and the role in her sort of experience of um, sort of self-perception and also like her family memories. Because white balance was developed to be calibrated for guess who? Yeah, people who look like me. Uh, which means that you know, they did a good job of representing people like me, um, but they didn't do a good job, good job of uh, people of color. And um, so the white balance was thrown out. And reading just these paragraphs is kind of heartbreaking, because the idea that you learn at an early age that you cannot be represented in a photograph, that's some bad technology <laughs> and some bad cultural impact. Uh, it's a fantastic article. I recommend reading it. Um, but then you look at these, these things that, that color balance was based on, and you start realizing why, you know, why some of this like, comes about. Uh, I love the, sort of, the basic look and the kitsch of these. Um, these are generally called Shirley cards. Uh, it was Canon who came out with them. And I think the, the one on the left is actually a um, conversation of several ones from different decades. I'm assuming the bottom right is the 80s. Uh, <laughs> looks very plausible to me. Uh, and the one on the right, while, you know, um, <laughs> just exciting in its own right, um, <laughs> is obviously excellent for color calibration, because it has all of them. Um, but, you know, okay, so just the fact that the word normal is implied there, you know, it implies a normal. There is a technological normal when it comes to photo reproduction. Now, I'm not saying that, like, the people who developed the chemical processes involved in making film were, like, you know, dyed in the wool racists and wanted to prevent people of color from being represented well in photography. Not at all, that seems unlikely. Um, most of these examples are very unlikely to be you know, the result of like, a conscious bias. However, there is a cognitive bias, and basically like, you, you, you have your known unknowns, and then you have your unknown unknowns, and that's where bias hides. Um, your known unknowns might be like, if you're organizing a conference and you know that you should have more women, but you don't know any more women to invite, that's your known unknown. 
If you have an unknown unknown, it's like you don't even realize that you're not calibrating for this. So this is a slightly more up upgraded one, um, which reminds me slightly of the, the announcement of this series of uh, underwear where nude is a color for everyone. Um, so this is a project by a student of mine, uh, Greg Dorsonwell, um, and he did a project where he, he used, he actually, uh, he was able to use uh, OpenCV to track um, basically faces in, um, in primetime television, and then he was able to do um, an indexing to find out what is the, the color representation or the ethnicity representation in an evening of programming. So he did this sort of index-based thing. To me, this is an excellent use of data. Um, to use it to express something which is, you know, of course, an implied and experienced reality as a hard, observable fact. That works. Um, this is for light relief, actually. Uh, you might have seen this. Um, this is Adam Harvey with a, a project that's essentially, it gives you instructions on how to avoid being recognized by a, like a facial recognition software. So it's the opposite problem. <laughs> um, essentially because OpenCV, et cetera, relies on identifying certain, certain ridges and certain configurations uh, of features. If you, can, if you can demolish those features, if you can remove your eyebrows and make um, things you know, sideways, then it works. Okay, this should not be there. Um, let me just turn off the internet or turn this thing off. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so it's the opposite problem, and I'm sure you've seen it referred to. Um, for instance, uh, I tweeted about this, which is from Elementary, you know, the Sherlock Holmes show. Um, it's a really stupid implementation uh, compared to, you know, I, I think uh, Adam's implementation is way more elegant. <laughs> This is like just like the worst punk you ever met. <laughs> um, but he, uh, it's also included in Minority Report, where one of the characters has permanent tattoo, tattoos to like obscure facial recognition. Uh, this is a funny case where like it's is rare, but it's happened a couple of times where I know people whose work has ended up as like pop culture references on like sciency, uh, pro, like you know procedural shows. But but if, if, you know, simple image processing can be, you know, problematic in itself, mostly due to calibration errors, what about machine learning? <laughs> machine learning, just to me, is just, you know, like, I have so many friends who are, like, extremely excited about it. There's entire new, you know, genres of work, like, popping up. And yet, you know, we know they're, you know, they're fuzzy, and they're prone to, like, error, and, uh, you know, we like them because they have some reliability, but in the real world, if you're going to make this into a product, then some of that just gets terrifying. Uh, because, it, a, and, you know, an object recognizer, which is hilarious um, in, like, misidentifying objects while you're debugging, could misidentify objects or people while um, not debugging and just, you know, have a huge impact on your brand. Uh, if you're just an app developer, I mean, if you're Google, you can survive it. But if you're like a single like app developer, probably that social media firestorm is something you couldn't survive. Because um, this is the Daily Mail, not my favorite newspaper. Um, <laughs> I had an article about Flickr introducing auto-tagging in a very rushed way around the same time that Google Photos started doing it. And this is the gate to Dachau uh, concentration camp, which it has labeled sport architecture jungle gym. Which, of course, as technologists, we all say like, oh yeah, I can see how that makes sense. But as your grandma end user, that's not gonna fly. Um, this one is very hard to catch. They're like, you know, a lot of these issues are deeply complex. I'm not saying they're trivial. It's not like you could just flip a switch and it'll go away. But this is some fucked up shit. Um, Finding a tag album in your Google Photos where you and your friend have been tagged as gorillas, that's not forgivable. You know, those software engineers and those project managers should get, yeah. <clears throat> Their head should roll. Um, my favorite thing about this, uh, not that there are any favorite things about this, but um, the bottom is like, he says, what kind of sample image data you collected that would result in this, son? <laughs> which, um, yeah, is exactly the problem. <clears throat> so, but that's, you know, the simple, again, like still this is simpler stuff. This is about like tagging images, 
Sure, it's hugely offensive, but it's unlikely to ruin your life. This stuff is likely to ruin your life, or someone's life. Um, this is an article from ProPublica, uh, which has been uh, dealing a lot recently with the idea of bias in algorithms, particularly in machine learning, et cetera. And this is about uh, crime risk assessment software, where um, the risk of someone repeat offending uh, is calculated based on various factors, factors that we as, the, as you know, the public are not allowed to know because it's a proprietary commercial software. Um, and they weigh different factors in different ways. And sure enough, um, it seems to have a predilection for identifying white offenders as unlikely to reoffend, and other you know, people of other colors likely to, uh, to offend. This is, you know, this is real. Um, the fact that this is out there in courts right now, the fact that um, people don't necessarily have the right to, to address you know, what, how is that judgment being made, there's no good. Um, systems of recourse. I mean, try critiquing an algorithm in a courtroom. We all know how that went for Apple and Google. You know, it's like, if you follow the transcripts from, from the Apple versus Google trial, half of it was, you know, technical experts explaining compression algorithms to lay audiences. Um, so try, yeah, good luck trying to like explain that, you know, the machine learning system, which we all believe in, has been trained badly. Um, what about the machine learning algorithm that, um, uh, that the CIA, et cetera, like uses to identify terrorists when they admitted that we only have training data based on like maybe 20, 30 known terrorists, but we think these other people are terrorists too. <laughs> and that thing is used to like inform drone strikes. That's some bad technology. So um, that's, the real, that's probably the biggest one of all. Um, a more seemingly trivial one is the idea of data collection. You know, uh, if you're writing a social media app, um, you're gonna write into it all kinds of ways of recording um, interactions and meta metadata. You know, again, metadata is also a favorite of people trying to track terrorists. And the reason why is because metadata is extremely revealing. Um, if I can see all the, like, just when you sent all the text messages you sent to like different people, I can tell you like who these people likely are in your life. Um, you know, give and take some. If there's a gap in your Facebook messaging data for two months, like one of my students had, then there's a reason why you weren't there. Either you were in hospital, or you were traveling, or, which happened to be correct, someone's stalking you on Facebook. That, you know, a gap in the data will be very revealing. So <clears throat> we accept that large corporations, particularly here in America, we accept that corporations have the right or the privilege to collect and correlate. Whereas if, in Europe, there's actually very strict restrictions on you might be able to collect this data over here, but you can't correlate it to that over there. In America, how often do you hear of a corporation being defeated from doing that? Um, if you've ever passed a, a, a car with an automated uh, number plate reader, like on the street, then you know that that, that, you know, that car is just sucking down number plates that it sees. It might do it directly for law enforcement, like they do in, in England, or it might just actually be um, agglomerated into uh, a distributed database using the idea of distributed data collection, which they can sell to whoever um, for whatever purpose. So not only is the issue of what data is collected and is it controlled, but how is it collected? Do you collect more than you need? You know, how many times have you turned off uh, permissions for an app where like, I don't think you need my contacts. You're a picture taking thing. Um, also, which fields are being collected? Okay, thankfully, we do have some restrictions on that, like uh, very few sort of social messaging apps are gonna ask you about your sexual preference, unless it's Grindr. Um, but, you know, for the most part, we know that there's some stuff that they're not supposed to do. But our, our tolerance level for like clicking yes is, is remarkably high. And on the developer side, who's gonna tell the developer not to collect more than you need? Which should be the principle, right? You know, collect what you need, don't collect more than you don't than you do, um, because down the road, you know, all the hacks that we have, etc. People, people can start correlating data from multiple um, services. I mean, let's face it: no service is essentially unhackable. You know, they might be less likely to be, but I think the the interference of hackers from wherever in the current American election is kind of showing us a new future in which, 
yeah, just assume that data that you're collecting, like as part of your algorithm or your database, might get out there, and what might that mean for the people whose data that is? And similarly, what in society where data is missing, you know, what could be the plausible reason for that when they, you know, the government collects all kinds of other data? And of course, I'm talking about um, the horrific recent streak of, well, not recent streak, this is not recent, it's the discussion about it is recent. Um, you know, the impunity by which the police is able to act violently and kill uh, members of society, primarily African American, without any real legal repercussions and without that even being recorded by society. That absence of data isn't, it's not an accident. You know, if they collect all your tax records but they happen to not collect uh, data on like potential ties between politicians and what and like uh, tax havens like that wouldn't be a mistake <laughs> That would be by design um, So there's multiple of these this is the the counted by the Guardian uh, which is, again is ironic because this is a, a liberal um, UK newspaper uh, and they've done a pretty good job. They've had a, an open data effort on uh, Related to data journalism, which is a very exciting field all on its own um, but there are also some others. Fatal Encounters is probably the first one. Um, they started tracking around 2012, which was before, of course, Ferguson, not far from here, happened. Um, and uh, it even led to this, this sort of slightly ironic situation where the Washington Post won a Pulitzer for collecting data on police violence as inspired directly by Fatal Encounters. In fact, Fatal Encounters formed the kernel for the data collection of the Washington Post. So careful, um, if you're doing open data, your success could be someone else's Pulitzer. That might you know, taste a little funny. Um, <laughs> so the idea is that with power comes responsibility, which of course is something we know in, you know in general we accept this. But I think when you're developing technology, the, you know, uh, for the same reason why drone pilots and fighter pilots in general have like a, an easier time um, killing whoever than someone who has to do it with a bayonet up close. Like there's actually research that shows most soldiers will not shoot a human being at like less than 30 yards. They will shoot in the air. There will be like a small percentage that will actually shoot. But if you're, if you're just operating some drone platform that, you know, you're at a great, great distance. And in the same way, I would argue that the distance that we have to the people that we collect data on, for instance, if we're creating apps, um, it kind of trivializes in the moment the idea of what we're, you know, what are we, what could be the potential harmful implications for them. Um, you know, I have no doubt that the developers who wrote that algorithm for crime risk assessment are not necessarily bad people. You know, they're probably, maybe they're slightly more leaning towards law and order, but you know, I'm sure they think that their crime assessment algorithm is relevant. The problem is, you know, could, without transparency, and like, first of all, you can ask, like, is that ever a relevant way of doing justice? Like, do we want a kind of judge dread type of world where we just have like, you know, yes or no, um, the moment you walk in the door? Or, you know, uh, and if not, and if we do accept automated systems as part of our crime system, how do we um, review them? How, you know, what is the transparency aspect when the algorithms are proprietary? So <clears throat> I would say in general, you know, collect only what you need. Don't overstate your intentions. Don't assume that what works for you works for everyone else. And don't blame the algorithm. It's not a puppy. Um, by which I mean, of course, it's your fault, not the algorithm. Um, so. Acknowledging that you have bias or privilege is not the same as admit, admitting fault or guilt. That's a very unproductive um, feeling, which is you know, a very reasonable thing to, to think, uh, particularly if you're confronted with something that you're not necessarily proud of, but you know, your intentions were good or whatever. But acknowledging that you have bias uh, is acknowledging that you're alive, uh, that you're a human being. Like Every human being has bias of one form or another. We, you know, you select your friends based on who you like.
Norwegian guy in the room and say, like, so how can we include Norwegians in this conversation? You know, that shouldn't be mine to, to answer. Um, so to quote a good friend of mine, you can either be the best or you can be the worst. Um, all right, how are we on time? We've got, that was 45, right? All right, cool. Uh, I did have some, uh, the talk that I actually like promised is also in here. <laughs> um, how many have uh, implemented circle packing? Not more? How many computational ge uh, geometry fans in the room? Oh, that's better. Yeah, I heard some marching cubes being, being mentioned. Uh, so the original talk is about how certain algorithms have very strong in, intrinsic forms, and that's why they're both popular and potentially terrible as creative tools. Um, so this is circle packing. Um, this is what you get when you just search for, for circle packing. This is circle packing architecture. Architecture is great for uh, looking at sort of algorithms as creative cliches because um, they're, they're just cycling through them really rapidly. If you know what Grasshopper is, which is like a patching-based language for uh, Rhino, which is a very po popular uh, CAD tool, um, you know that you can just basically use Reinhopper to get architecture with filters. It's like the mid-90s all over again. Um, this is my packing, circle packing project. I, I can like claim, like, well, I did it in 2007. You know, in this field, that's like a long time ago. Um, <laughs> Voronoi, also very popular. Uh, this will be in the PDF. Um, this is a fun one. This is the Grasshopper forums, and it's a request for code to help them do what you see on the right, which, of course, is my work. <laughs> so I guess that's like uh, an um, inadvertent kudos. Like, you know, the most sincere form of flattery is copying. Um, all right, I can't do this justice. Uh, I hope the, just, the justice talk was worth it. Uh, I, find, I find those... Uh, I, Examples terrifying partly because I work with a lot of people who might be the creators of these things. That's why you know I, I you know I talk about it from my perspective, which is that I'm terrified of being a creator of a tool that's like destructive. Um, one thing that strikes me is that I should have included another half, like to complement that, which would be the tools that actually do the opposite, that actually support people in uh, taking back the power or report, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and there are those tools, and I think data as a sort of justice tool is potentially really great, um, but it's not just gonna happen on its own. Questions? <laughs> yep. I, I have a remark for the first question. Uh, from what I understand, there is a new European Union regulation coming up that is supposed to make the algorithm, uh, force the creators to be able to provide explanation for their decisions. So it will be pretty exciting change for the, all the algorithm designers. Yeah, that's like PageRank. You know, PageRank is proprietary and maybe for a good reason, but I don't know if cert, you know, to preventing SEO is worth like, not even knowing what's going on. <laughs> I mean, that's, um, yeah. I, I, I haven't followed the, sort of the recent politics in Europe living in Brooklyn, um, but in general, you know, like over here, when Germany says you're, to Facebook, you're not allowed to collect that data, you know, the media here, like, it's like, look at those crazy Germans. <laughs> Why shouldn't you be able to? Anyone else? I wish I, I wish I had some great examples just, uh, yeah. So the question is, uh, am I aware of anyone who's figured out that whatever like, service they're working on has that kind of bias issue and then corrected themselves? Um, I'd have to say I'm not aware of it. I fervently hope that just like you know, alien life in the universe exists, like I hope that it exists. I would love to hear that story. Um, say again? Oh, right. Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting case because Airbnb and that other like neighborhood watch um, service, I don't remember the name of it. Nextdoor. Nextdoor. Um, you know, primarily I think the changes are like mostly about um, terminology and reporting. And it's like, 
I, I used to have to like uh, argue to my students that the web page design of Facebook is the same thing as like designing like your, the house you're going to like act in. But even that kind of stuff, which is fairly trivial to even like imagine, and you'd wonder why they wouldn't do it like in the first place. Um, you know, that stuff is, should be done, and I don't think any company gets to sort of say like, oh, that's not my fault. We have racist users. Um, okay, Cupid is an interesting case there where. Um, you know, they, is everybody familiar with OkCupid's like data blog, et cetera? Um, it's an interesting one because they have a real data set that represents dating. The problem is um, they have one article which um, primarily shows like who is preferred, um, you know, as groups on OkCupid. But that's sort of the problem because I, I don't show that piece to students because I don't want to reinforce in my students' head that is just how it is. That's one of the problems with data collection you tend to just believe that this is how it is, and you're not necessarily considering what are the affordances that might lead this to be true. Um, I'm not saying that like, you should have some didactic like, uh, you know, part of OkCupid okay like, encouraging you to, to date along like, gender and, and racial lines. That would be a little patronizing. But to think that it is just true that, um, you know, that there is that divide is not understanding the data. Um, Whoa, okay. Um, so, pick, so to piggyback on this idea that we as developers should really be thinking actively about these questions, how much data do I collect? What does it mean? Um, I've kind of heard this similar thought in spaces like Rai Ghani with uh, do good data for social justice. Mm -hmm. And for them, they, they find that people just don't understand even the impacts of their data or what kind of data they have. Can you recommend any resources that are good for people to digest that perhaps is an introduction into saying this mm -hmm. is actually data these are the kind of concerns, like a bullet list item, I don't know. But I'm curious if there's anything you could recommend that can help start that discourse. Um, I can't recommend one like offhand, but I know that in the process of teaching, one of the fine things that I've found is teaching uh, students about data using like an existing big data set is pretty much useless. Making them track their own like travel through the city, that gets creepy real fast. Um, there's, uh, there was someone who actually did that at SVA where they collected the moves, you know, the moves app, which is basically GPS and step tracking. They collected all the moves data for all the students in the class, and um, sure enough, they found out who was dating. Um, <laughs> that stuff gets, you know, it gets creepy because of what you can see, and most people accept in the abstract that sure, you might be able to see this, but most, I think most users are simply not aware of the power of it. You know? Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Any final fun, exciting questions? I think I need to lighten up that talk. <laughs> I mean, it's real, but it's a little on the nose. For the record, I should say I personally don't develop any social justice tools. I'm not saying that, like, I know how to fix this. I just, all I know is. Uh, I have a lot of people who are very good people and very smart developing tools, and I'm yeah, kind of terrified of seeing where this goes. Um, there, there have been multiple, uh, there are actually some good examples where um, there's a tool called Floodwatch from uh, the Office for Creative Research, which helps you track like online um, you know, tracking software, et cetera. That's one of those areas where, where there is quite a lot of research. Ironically, privacy in data has become sort of the cool macho thing, which is like, which is ironic because it's like, that's actually a fairly easy thing to track. You know, bias is a way more powerful and, and harder thing to track. Uh, so Adam Harvey, who I showed you earlier, like he's, he's like really um, in the privacy thing uh, in an interesting way. He also, along with that project where you um, can obscure your face from facial recognition, he also has an anti-drone um, burqa, which is essentially um, a ref heat reflective material, which does make you invisible to um, to infrared cameras. It's pretty, pretty amazing. Uh, recommend looking at it. Thank you very much. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Thanks.